Is that for the opening of the show in Houston? Well, he opened it. And then he, um, I came back here. He went to Boston, and then we hooked up again in Washington. So what did he say? He's still there now. What did he say? Well, he's funny. I mean, he loved it because he knows a lot of the llamas Mm -hmm. that I took pictures Mm of. He was there at most of the places that are photographed. Um, The Tibetans have a funny aesthetic. They would rather see things really sharp and in color, you know? Right. It's a... Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And that to them is photography. They want it to look like real, like real life, Mm -hmm. or their version of real life. So this kind of expressionistic photography here is not exactly. They want to know why it's blurred. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, me too. Why are the figures me moving? Me too. Why are they? Because they're revealing something other than what you see with your eye. Mm-hmm. It reveals the ghosts and the spirits behind the obvious. Mm-hmm. But let's talk on film here. We're wasting. Yeah. Okay. You ready to go? Why don't you put the table beside? Okay, thanks. So when was the first time you contacted me about this? This was a while ago, wasn't it? Oh, a long time ago, y- no. years ago. I think so, yeah. yeah. You ready to go? Let's go. I really, I mean, I really worked, t- or my staff really worked very, very hard. I was just asking <laughs> Christina, the first time she uh, contacted me about doing an interview, which mm-hmm. I think must have been at least two years ago, yeah, maybe I think more, so. yeah. four maybe. I don't remember when I started, but it was a long time yeah. ago. So here we are. Yeah. It took longer time to get an interview with you than to get an interview with Dalai Lama. Doesn't seem right, does it? No. <laughs> or yes, maybe. I don't know. No, it doesn't we'll seem see. right. So. Um, He's much nicer than I am. He is? Yeah. I don't know yet. (laughs) He's very nice. He's a a very genuine, true-hearted person, yeah. Mm -hmm. We aspire to be that. You're an actor on stage, film. You are uh, uh, the founder of the Tibet House in New York. You're very good at horse riding. You play the guitar very well. And other instruments as well? Piano. Trumpet? Trumpet, piano, guitar. Mm-hmm. Trumpet, not for a long time. I did it in Cotton Club, but I haven't played it since then. Either. And now you're a photographer, too. There are other secrets, too. Life is long. Other secrets will come out. OK, I hope during this interview. Not too many today. <laughs> yeah. OK, so tell me about this uh, exhibition of photos. Why, why do you do it right now? Well, it's, it's frankly to raise some money for the Tibetans. and. Um, I happen to like it. You know, I like this work. Um, I, I've been taking pictures a long time, since I was a kid. Um, I think there's an aesthetic here that I was interested in exploring. I don't see explored very much with the Tibetans. Usually there's a kind of uh, National Geographic photograph taken of, of the Tibetans, um, which kind of captures a romantic color side of them. And um, I wanted to capture something that was below the surface. Uh, and I've, I've been around the Tibetans for 15 years now, and I, 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 I do feel something more than the surface kind of excitement mm-hmm. and romance of being around them. And I, I, I uh, wanted to put this show together to raise money for them, but also to explore that a little bit. So I have these two portfolios. One is of photos taken outside of Tibet in the exile community, and the others taken inside of Tibet. But no photos from Dharamsala. Hmm? No photos from Dharamsala. Well, I actually snuck one in there. Yeah? And said it's from Zanskar, but it's close enough. Oh, I didn't recognize it then. Yeah. Listen, you go to Dharamsala quite often. Yeah. How do you go there? How do I go there? How, how do, do I get there? there? I mean, how do you get there? Uh, well, in the old days, it was really hard to get there. You'd fly to Delhi. And then you take a train to Petankot, 
and then you'd get uh, you know a taxi or hire a car or somehow get from there to Dharamsala. It was a long trip. Yeah, because I went to Delhi and then by car it took us 18 yeah. hours. Yeah, that's that's the worst way to go. The worst trip of my life. The bus is probably worse than that, but mm -hmm. other than that, those are really bad. Take the train next time. But you see, you can fly there now. In the right season, there is a plane that goes there. And in a way, it's almost too easy. I, I think it was better in the old days when it was really hard to get the, mm -hmm. the sense of anticipation and that you have committed yourself to a pilgrimage. I think made it even a richer experience. So what do you do when you are in Dharamsala? Well, I usually go for teachings. You know, I don't go for a vacation. It's, there's a specific teaching going on. Uh, almost always His Holiness would be the reason one would go there. His Holiness teaches um, every year in the time of Losar, or their, their uh, New Year. And it also coincides with their March 10th celebrations. And that, that's the March 10th, started in March 10th, 1959. And that's when the, the Chinese finally started the, uh, the shelling, the bombardment of the Potala and the Dalai Lama very miraculously escaped from Tibet. And that's when the mass exodus started. First about 80,000 Tibetans gone out, now there are about 120, 130,000 who have gotten out of Tibet. And it's that failed uprising against the Chinese that is celebrated every March 10th. So I'll go for teachings with His Holiness, see my other teachers, uh, renew friendships with other students. So what do you get out from the Buddhists? Buddhism that you don't get anywhere else? You know, there's, there's a thing called the Triple Gem that in Buddhism one venerates and, and spends a lot of time considering. And these are the three jewels. And the, the first jewel is the Buddha himself, who is this light and uh, who accomplished these extraordinary things in his lifetime through very hard work, extraordinary hard work. Not because he was born a Buddha, but he did the work to become a Buddha. Uh, the second is the Dharma, or his teachings. And it's a very systematic thing he laid out for us to follow, to do work on ourselves that eventually would lead us to Buddhahood, or clarity, uh, to totally open hearts and totally expanded minds with no impediments. So how far did you go so far? I have nowhere. I'm still crawling <laughs> like a baby. And the third of the jewels is called the Sangha. And the Sangha is the community of people who were trying to walk the same road. And I think that's one of the important things about especially going to Dharamsala or spending time with teachers at teachings is that you become part of a community again of people. And if you live in a community, uh, you have these higher ideals are being supported in you, in your life, in your mind. Uh, it, it makes, it makes uh, progress much faster. And obviously when you do this kind of work, this inner work, you're constantly coming upon problem areas. There's a lot of pain, there's a lot of suffering involved, things to break through. And having the support of other people who are walking the same path mm -hmm. and are having the same problems you're having uh, makes it easier, you know, makes it supported, makes it more loving. But it was a very long time ago that you started becoming interested in Buddhism. It was uh, quite some time since you started becoming interested in Buddhism, yeah. like 20 years so? Yeah, I was 24 when I started. Mm -hmm. It was Zen Buddhism then. It was, uh, yeah. My first teachers were Japanese. So what attracted you to the Buddhism? Oh, I think most of all it was the sense that, that in the end there's nothing to hold on to that everything is to be challenged. You know, in Western philosophy, you, you start with a series of givens, and then you build a logical system based on those givens. In Buddhism, there's no given. You challenge all the givens. Mm -hmm. You take it right back to the beginning until you get back to a single particle, the universe itself generating from a single particle. And even that particle was born of emptiness. Mm -hmm. So nothing is left to hold on to. Everything is challenged. So the conventional mind is bypassed, and you start to key into a much wider frame of, of reference. On a practical plane, um, I found that the, the, the dual aspect, the, the dual trainings of mind and heart 
wisdom and compassion uh, are totally compatible and beautifully integrated in these teachings. Uh, great understanding of the heart, great understanding of the body and the energy channels in the body, but uh, very profound teachings on opening the heart and, and, and the wisdom side, obviously, what is reality? What is this thing that we take to be very true and very hard and solid and absolute, but uh, the more you explore it and look for it, you can't find it. That in fact, it's a quite fluid uh, construct. Mm -hmm. But I mean, to a lot of people, you're a man who has everything. You have money, you have fame, you're good looking, you have sex appeal. Every one of those things is ephemeral. Ephemeral. It's only of the moment, then it's gone. You so know, if you're looking for happiness, you, uh, you want to look for ultimate happiness. You want to look for a happiness that is there through infinity. You know, so th th these things, are what, what appears to be happiness here is very small, very simple things to really of a, a superficial nature. Like what? That you just mentioned. So what is happiness to you? Happiness is this expansion. It really is being able to open your heart well, the prime teaching, really, of Buddhism is interrelatedness. All things are connected and interrelated. And it's because of the concept of emptiness that that's possible. Uh, emptiness is, is kind of misunderstood. It was misunderstood by me very much in the beginning. I think I... Yeah, I had great I problems understanding what he meant. I can't say that I understand it now, but I understand more what it isn't. Mm -hmm. And when I started studying, I think I had this kind of hope that I would disappear. When this emptiness thing would happen, I would disappear. Mm -hmm. Now, in some sense, you do disappear because the ego disappears. But you don't disappear. The mind doesn't disappear. Mm -hmm. Consciousness doesn't disappear. Um, emptiness is really that things are empty of absolute existence. Things exist, but only in a relative way, only in a very changing way. But when I came to Dalai Lama, I came with all these questions, you know, about life. And I thought, mm. now I'm going to get all the answers. Mm. And then when I came back home, I realized I had all the questions left. Mm. Did you, re did you uh, experience that? Well, it's that? more important to have answers. I mean, I'm sorry, it's more important to have questions than answers. Questions give you energy. You know, I remember Picasso, he was asked about uh, computers. And he said, Pablo, what do you think about computers? And he thought, I said, ah. I'm not that impressed by them. I said, why not? He said, well, computers can only come up with answers. <laughs> it's the questions that are important. Yeah. The questions will always be there. You know, there comes a point, I think, when in Zen they call it a critical mass or mm -hmm. of questioning. And once you break through that, then it's not a question of questions or answers anymore. Things just are as they are. Mm -hmm. But I know that you also asked Dalai Lama questions, like when you wanted to have kids, you asked, you asked something we about We talked that. about children, but we talked about a lot of things. It's mm -hmm. not like... Do you remember what kind of answer you got when you asked him about whether you should have kids or not? He asked me a question. He said, why? And uh, I said, you know, look, as, as I'm not a kid anymore myself. I said, I think it's, it's, it's a... It's a way to open your heart even more. And um, His Holiness said, um, well, it might be a smaller love than what you're looking for. It might be a larger one that one should aspire to. And that's certainly nothing against kids or anything, but if you're looking for ultimate openness and expansion, and essentially the love of a Buddha, uh, that's a much larger thing. Can you use... Uh, okay, I have some drink. And he's really the key mm -hmm. to everything in New York. Mm -hmm. So Rinch and Darlow you'd want to talk to. Mm -hmm. um, I think you'd also want to talk to Lodi Gary. Mm -hmm who was His Holiness representative mm -hmm. in Washington mm -hmm. for the international campaign. You know, those are really the important groups. The Office of Tibet mm -hmm. and the International Campaign for Tibet. Okay. 
Can you use Buddhism in a very practical way in your life? Oh you yeah, of course. I mean, any kind of problem you have, uh, we all get bound up in some kind of opera, <laughs> you know, whatever we're doing. And uh, usually they, they only have a very small relationship to reality. We just start to build a whole operatic emotional thing around events. Um, I think with this kind of study, this kind of exploration, you start to understand emotions in a different way. You understand the mind itself in a different way. It's, it's incredibly, as I said before, that you have nothing left to hide behind. You have no set of preconceptions that you're, you're, you're left to hide with. Mm -hmm. but Challenge I mean everything. So any, any circumstance, uh, we, we have a cloud, we have a kind of a layer of preconceptions about, and which is based on you know, previous traumas in our lives, uh, psychological breakdowns and, and misprogramming and childhood traumas, all of that. If one understands these, these things about how the mind works, not really about the big concepts, but simply how this computer mind works, um, I think we can have much more open relationships with other people, and certainly the relations we have within families, within marriages, within countries, uh, internationally the same thing. All those kind of fears and, and defensive emotional stances go away. You embrace everyone as being you, essentially. Mm -hmm. Your happiness is certainly equal to my happiness, and if I was a Buddha, it would be more important, your happiness. So, I mean, that obviously transforms all interaction when you start to, to face things that way. But this is very, very hard in reality. I mean, wh what's the most common frustration that you meet with as a celebrity? Preconceptions, you know, is what I'm talking about. You, we've never met before. I'm sure you have a million preconceptions mm -hmm. of me. I don't have any of you because I've never met you before and I don't know anything. Mm. You think you know something mm -hmm. about me. Well, most everything in our lives is that way. We put them into categories. You know, the brain tends to do that. It mm -hmm. categorizes things. As a child, it doesn't because it's all new impulse. Mm -hmm. But very quickly, the brain starts to put things into mm -hmm. categories and then we relate to things as a category mm -hmm. rather than the specific. Mm -hmm. So uh, you mean that uh, people's picture of you is what, what can uh, irritate you most, that they have a pic they think they I don't get irritated like. about that. No. No, what is the problem for other people to drop that for a second and have a fresh experience? Okay, so when do you get irritated? I don't get much anymore. No? Sure. No. Are you never arrogant? Like, I mean, this is one of the preconceptions that I had about you, uh, being, you know, kind of arrogant and uh, aggressive sometimes? No, no, not a side of it. That was a long time ago probably never existed. No? No. Just rumors. So w w what do you think about all the rumors that have been going on about you? No, oh, I don't know. I don't listen to rumors. Rumors are <laughs> there. It's nothing. But I'm sure they must have affected you at one stage in your life. I don't really listen to these things. This mm -hmm. is not a powerful thing. These are, these are a, a child's level of viewing things. And I refuse to. I'm I'm a grown up. But I mean, when you were when you were married, or maybe you're still married, I, I'm and I'm not quite sure. To Cindy Crawford, you put this advert in in the English Time. Uh, you know, saying that uh, we are heterosexual, we were happily married. I mean, this was because of rumors. So apparently, you no you more than rumors. There was things being printed in the newspaper. Mm -hmm. That's not a rumor. Okay, so that's what I'm talking talking yeah, about. So we put something in the same newspapers. I essentially had a choice of suing everyone, which I don't want to spend the rest of my life in litigation, mm -hmm. or doing something like that. And that seemed to be the most adult thing to do, frankly. Mm -hmm. But do you really mean that you didn't get angry when they were writing all these kinds of things about you, that you're homosexual and that you're divorcing? No, and that you're no but it wasn't true at the time, so how could I be angry about it? You understand? No, I don't understand. If something is not true, mm -hmm. it's not true. Someone saying that it's true doesn't make mm -hmm. it true. Things are as they are. If you say this is a glass of beer, mm -hmm. and I know it's a glass of water, and you insist it's beer... Okay, but if somebody is saying, you know, nasty things about me at home, 
you know, I mean, maybe this I don't care, but I care question. because, yeah, I, I care because not, of my this family. This is a line of question that doesn't interest me. Okay. You're going into an area that, it's, these, these are not concerns of mine. It's a waste of energy to get involved with that stuff. It really is, for you and for me, and for anyone else. Okay, but I want to know in a very uh, easily, I want to know in a very easily understandable way I mean, how can Buddhism, in a very uh, simple way, help it's you exactly with your frustrations? Exactly what I said. You look at reality. See, I, let me go back to what I said before. You weren't following me. If you start to put an overlay of opera on things, mm -hmm. and I mean by opera, things that aren't necessarily true, you start to build dramas on top of things, then you lose sight of the fact of very simple truths. Mm -hmm. The simple truth is, this is a glass of water. Now, you can build a whole drama about this, but the truth is, it's simply a glass of water. Beyond that, it doesn't matter. Okay, on the way here, there was a traffic jam. There's always a traffic jam in New York. Okay. I'm sure you must be in the traffic jam too. Sure. And I mean, I wanted to be here in time. I got very irritated. Look, there's two things. There's a wonderful teacher named Shanti Deva, wonderful Indian teacher, mm -hmm. um, who studied at Nalanda University, I think, which when Nalanda was the great Buddhistic university in India. And um, there's a very interesting thing to say. Look, if you're having a problem and there's something you can do about it, do it. If there's nothing you can do about it, why worry? Mm -hmm. If you're in a traffic jam and there's nothing you can do about it, <laughs> why get crazy? But I mean... No? Yeah, yeah you're, you're right, but I, I, I just have a problem really believing that you've gone this far, because I mean, if it's, if it's right far. what you say... This is only oh, the sure, beginning. Sure, you say you're crawling, but I mean, if you don't this get irritated... This is only the beginning. This is simple stuff. This is kid stuff. Okay, so I mean, tell beyond me... Beyond the that, th these are, they're real training beyond that. These are only the simple things mm -hmm. that children do, that you and I have to deal with, mm -hmm. because we have no discipline over our minds mm -hmm. and our emotions. Mm -hmm. So we get irritated by traffic, and therefore we're in different situations and we get involved with wars and start dropping bombs for the same kind of silly frustrations about being caught in traffic. Okay. So you, you understand? I understand. But, I so mean, these are really low-level things. Yeah, okay. This is like animal life things. Yeah. But most of us are kind of yeah, living absolutely, on that level. Absolutely, but we're trying to get out of that. Okay. That's the point. So you are to help us with that. I'm not helping anything. It's not my job to help, and I'm not equipped to. The Dalai Lama is equipped to, and mm -hmm. other teachers who have really done the work on themselves. But I mean, you went to the middle of nowhere in Sweden. You had a nice swim in a lake. Hmm? And there were paparazzis there, and the pictures of you and Stina, nice name, was all over the world. <laughs> Did that irritate you? It doesn't change the fact that it was a perfectly nice day. We had a perfectly nice swim. <laughs> it doesn't change. You're not following this line of thought. You're still yeah. insisting on finding negativity everywhere and frustration everywhere. The simple fact is, this was a glass of water. We went swimming in a lake. Basta. Everything on top of that is opera. It's a falsehood. You understand? Yeah, I understand. Relate to the simple always. Okay. To the simple truth. What did you think of the photographer? Did you have any feelings? You're obsessing on this thing. Get into another subject that's more interesting. This is a kind of a tabloid thing you're getting into now, which I'm not interested in. But, you know, what I'm trying to get at is certain things that Dalai Lama was talking about and that I had a problem following. And I mean, he said, for example, Look, to love, tell you the truth, love I the feel anime. sorry for a man who has to hide in the bushes taking pictures of people. That's a rather sad existence. So if anything, I feel pity for him. Simple. Because Dalai Lama said, love the enemy. No, ultimately there is no enemy. The enemy is anger. The enemy is hatred. The enemy is ignorance. These things are the enemy. So I thought for you, loving the enemy was loving the, uh, the paparazzis. 
Yeah, love is love. I feel pity for him that he has to... Can you imagine making a living that way? It's a horrible existence. And karmically, it's very bad for him. Mm -hmm. So I feel pity for him. What is even more difficult to understand, I think, is how... What is even more difficult to understand, I think, is how Dalai Lama is able to love the Chinese. Well, the same way. But same don't way. you have, I mean, to, to for, for, for Westerners, I think, it, it's much more easy to understand, you know, fight, make resistance, make... Uh, it's just what I told you. Simply go back to the simple always. The enemies are hatred. The enemies are anger. The enemies are ignorance. You know, these are the things that are real enemies. You know, if you see the person who has anger and hatred and ignorance as a sick person, someone who has an illness, mm -hmm. they have an illness of anger, they have an illness of hatred, they have an illness of ignorance, or what other you know, horrible thing they're infected with, that is the enemy. The person, you know, think of like a family member who's ill. It transforms absolutely how you feel about mm -hmm. situations. Can you be optimistic when it comes to the future of Tibet? Sure. Sure. Ultimately, things work out in a positive way. There's Do you no question about it. Life itself is a healing process. Reality manifests to heal. Do you think that Dalai Lama will be able to go back in his lifetime to Tibet? I would think so, yeah. yeah I've never thought he wouldn't, so I know he does. When, when are you having problems feeling compassion? When I get caught in the operas that I mentioned before, that are common to all of us. We seem to have a programming to make operas. But w what's your opera? It's a funny way of saying it, opera. An opera is a, is, it's a fiction. I understand what you mean, but, but I mean, what is your opera? The opera is the same as everyone. You know, you start to build on one simple little thing and based on you know, the, the usual human response, mm -hmm. which is defensiveness, which is someone's taking something away from me, someone's trying to hurt me, someone is um, attacking me in some way. You know, we, we jump to those conclusions because we have societies that promote those things. Mm -hmm. We have advertising that promote those things. We have dramas that promote those things. And we don't have things that promote understanding of them and seeing them in a correct context. So whatever you have, whatever our wonderful sound man and cameraman has, we have these things in common, totally common. Mm -hmm. And they're, they are low-level things. They're, they're things that we should be able to deal with. Do you also believe in reincarnation? Do you also believe in reincarnation? Well, if you believe in a continuity of consciousness, that mind itself has no beginning or end, of course. Sure. Only logical. So, have you a feeling that you existed in another time before? I I have a feeling that I existed before I walked in this room. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, before <laughs> you, you know, were born. You know, <laughs> and I think it's the same thing. Yeah. You know, I seem to believe that I took a breath before this one. <laughs> and do you, and you certainly can see lifetimes in exactly the same way. I woke up this morning, and I you know, there seemed to be a life. There was a yesterday, something happened, and then I went to sleep, and then I woke up, but I seem to remember there was a yesterday. Reincarnation is the same. I went to the south of India and met a young boy, a Spanish boy, whose name is Osel. He's supposed to be the reincarnated Lama Yeshe. Do you believe that he is actually the Lama Yeshe? I wasn't Yeshe? a student of Lama Yeshe's, but I've met, I've met Osel, and he's a wonderful boy. And, and those who have been students of the previous Lama Yeshe uh, have absolute belief. Mm -hmm. So, if you will be reincarnated after this life, what kind of existence do you think that you would have? It will be based on what I do in this lifetime. So, if you do good things, it's going to be something nice? Sure. If the balance I mean, karma is much more complex than that, but essentially if I've used the energy that comes through me in this lifetime in positive ways, if I don't create negative situations for people, then the likelihood is that I will have a good rebirth. Yeah. Do you think that... Uh, and a good rebirth essentially means having 
the inclination and the time to do more work on your mind, on the nature of mind, and make more breakthroughs. Do you think that being a Buddhist makes you a, uh, a different, how shall I say? I'm thinking about your job now as, a, as an actor. Mm. Okay, think and then tell me you <laughs> Do you think that, um, I, I take it once again. When you She's having some problems here today because I'm not helping her. <laughs> See, I'm just not taking this in the direction she wants to go in. But I think she's loosening up. She's relaxing a little bit now. And she's going to get off this thing that she wanted to do. <laughs> You're feeling a little better about this now, I know. Okay. Well, how are you feeling? I'm fine. Yeah? I'm fine. I was just looking at this invitation, which I really like. That's um, one of the images in the show, which I happen to yeah, like. Yeah, we, we, we're going to take some. Can I go around the show? Shot. Yes, please. We'd love, to, we'd love to do that. This was actually taken in Zanskar which is a very remote yeah. region of mm. northwestern India uh, and is, you know, a pretty traditional Tibetan culture but in a very, still very remote area of India. It would, be, would have been western Tibet many, many years ago. So Dalai Lama, he meditates every morning from 3.30 3 to 7.30. That's just one of his meditations during the day. How much do you meditate? I usually get in at least an hour every morning. You know, I make sure it's, it's about that. Sometimes more. Very rarely less than that. Sometimes more. And do you do, like Dalai Lama, do you meditate on like emptiness? On a certain subject? <laughs> I wish there was a camera on her when she's asking these questions. <laughs> usually there is. I'm very happy it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Well, uh, to meditate on emptiness. Why you, did you, you say that? You throw it out like it's, like it's, well, of course, on emptiness. <laughs> <laughs> As if you know what that is. <laughs> no. Yes. I just know. I mean, he tried to explain to me what he was meditating on. So I'm not saying I understand it. His Holiness, I described to someone, I mean, this, this is a general context that you're doing this on. And certainly this group is not interested in the techniques so much as a general concept. But I, I remember His Holiness was asked once about um, what is a Buddhist? And it was the same kind of context. And he, it wasn't to do a half hour version, it was a very succinct thing. So he thought about it and he said, well, a Buddhist is someone who gets up in the morning, wakes up in the morning, sets his motivation for the day, and lives his day. So that's essentially what one does. One emerges from the dream realm, from sleep. You set your motivation for the day, set how your mind is going to function for that day, how your heart is going to function. And that will carry you through all the actions and thoughts and deeds and words of that day. So what was your motivation this morning? Well, every day it's setting up so that, that essentially you see other beings as more important than yourself. Essentially that, altruism. And there's certain other practices that have to do with how the body functions and the energy channels in the body. But the essential thing is to, is to, s to motivate and generate bodhicitta. And, and compassion. Bodhicitta literally means the mind of enlightenment. Mm. And when that starts to happen in your heart, you know, then life starts to change quite a bit. When you start to, bit by bit, pull the fear away from your heart. And it starts to open up. I remember there was a wonderful uh, story about Milarepa, who was a great saint, 12th century saint, I think, in uh, Tibet. And uh, he went to me meditate in a cave, and I was actually in his cave in Tibet. And he had, um, he was very determined, and he sat like a rock inside of his cave. And he had two stones, one was a white one and one was a black one. And he said, for every thought I have that's negative, I'm going to make a black mark on the top of this cave. And every positive thought, generous thought, altruistic thought, I'm going to put a white mark. And he found that very quickly, the entire top of the cave was black. <laughs> There's so many negative thoughts in his mind, like us. Mm -hmm. We're like that. 
but work and work and work over the years, there were a few white marks started to come up, and then more and more white. And after many, many years, the entire top of the cave was white. His mind was clear and only could generate positive thoughts and altruism and compassion. And that's the kind of work we're all trying to do in our lives, so that the ceiling of our cave is white. Mm -hmm. Our minds are white. Our hearts are white. So what does your cave look like? It's black. Really, really <laughs> pretty disgusting right now. Jesus, I think A it sounds very white to me. white marks up there, but it's still pretty black, yeah. Mm -hmm. Something that I had a problem understanding. 